Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this discussion of German foreign and security policy in times of war in Ukraine. My name is Paul Srauceps. I'm a journalist here in Riga, and I will be leading this discussion. Now, I have to point out immediately that we have a few, how can I put it, issues. The first one is that one of our panelists, uh, Tobias Winkler, who is a member of the German Bundestag, uh, oh, there he is. Is not here, as you can see, but he is, well, I can see him on the screen, and you can now see him on the screen as well. He is, as I understand, in Vienna Airport because of a certain kerfuffle with his, with his flights. And uh, Mr. Winkler, you will be with us for how long now? Let's just see, can you, can you so hear me? So, good, good morning. I, I, I'm with you for about 25 minutes, then I what? try to get on a flight because I still want to get to Riga. Uh, <laughs> despite the, the airlines doesn't want to, to bring me there, I, I will do so. Very good. So, uh, I'll make sure that Mr. Winkler has a chance to talk and uh, perhaps also that you have a chance to address some questions to him before he has to switch off his, switch off his camera and run to his flight. Uh, but in any case, we are also, as you note, four men here on stage and a fifth one on the screen. Uh, so I hope to engage also women in the audience uh, with question, uh, to have questions and so forth to, to guarantee the fact that everybody is heard and we're not just, um, as they say in America, mansplaining things to people all the time. Well, the topic of the discussion is one that uh, evokes a lot of emotions and sometimes also, uh, let's say, uh, conflicts, especially in our region, because German foreign policy has been the, the, an issue and a topic of discussion ever since February 24th, when Russia launched its massive uh, invasion of the rest of Ukraine, the part that it hadn't already invaded. And uh, on that day, on February 24th, in fact, there was an emergency meeting of the European Council Germany had initially resisted a package of sanctions, but much to many people's, I think, surprise, that evening it accepted that. And that Sunday, on February 27th, Chancellor Scholz addressed the German parliament in what was seen as a historic speech, saying that Germany would now significantly increase spending on the military defense, would send weapons to Ukraine, would work to cut its energy dependence on Russia. This speech, and that policy has been given a name, the Zeitenwende, and it was seen as a major change in German policy. We are almost eight months out from there, and the question is how much of that promise has been delivered, and how can we evaluate German policy since then? Uh, we have an excellent panel to talk about this, and uh, let me just introduce you from that point. It's uh, Thomas Kleiner Brockhoff, he is the Vice President and Executive Director of the Berlin Office of the German Marshall Fund, and before that he was advisor to German President Gauck, who he uh, advised on various policy issues. Next is Eric Bratberg, Senior Vice President of the Albright Stonebridge Group, uh, which is part of the Bronze Global Advisors, and Mr. Bratberg is based in Washington, so we'll see a bit of a transatlantic perspective here. Uh, to Mr. Winkler, as I already said, is uh, the member of the German uh, Bundestag for the CDU-CSU. Uh, he is uh, uh, on the Committee for uh, the European Union, a rapporteur for the Baltic States. And uh, joining me here as well on the stage after Mr. Winkler goes off to fly to Riga, Christian Held the German ambassador to Latvia will take over and hopefully if you have questions, he will be able to address them as well regarding German policy and German official policy. Now, as I said, the question of Germany's policy since the 24th of February, the 27th of February has been quite contentious in many issues. Uh, many people in our region, while admitting on the one hand that Germany has done a great deal in multilateral organizations, uh, we see the European Union continuing to adopt ever harsher sanctions against, against Russia. Germany has worked hard to decrease its dependence on Russian energy. Uh, but the question of military aid to Ukraine is very vexed. And uh, we know that, well, just this week in the Berlin Forum, the Latvian Minister of Defense asked 
an audience, can we trust Germany? This was, I think, uh, something that is not normally said by ministers of countries, it, especially if they go to the country that they're asking this of, but it reflects uh, the per perplexity and I think also the sort of, sort of uh, sense of disappointment among many people who feel that perhaps Germany has not been active enough. I suspect that people on the stage will have um, things to say about that. Maybe they won't agree. Maybe they think that this is unfair. I think this is a very important discussion, and I hope also that you will all have questions afterwards for, for our panelists about what is going on with Germany on this. Uh, Mr. Minkler, I'd like to start with you, since you're the one with a limited time. Since February 24th, what has Germany done right, and what has Germany, if anything, done wrong, or has, what hasn't it explained enough? How, how do you see this? How do you see Germany's policy since the 24th? Okay. A lot of a lot of things have happened since then. So the, this uh, Russian war that lasts uh, already for eight years against uh, Ukraine uh, with the 24th of February changed uh, Europe and changed, of course, uh, many many the situation in many countries. You mentioned the, the speech, uh, the Zeitenwende speech on, on 27th of February. This was um, a turning point in, in, in German politics. And uh, I think for, for many countries, um, this was, was very welcomed uh, that, that Germany takes or is, is ready to take, to take a lead role also in, in uh, military aid uh, concerning Europe. And uh, we also from the, from the opposition party, from the CDU, CSU, we were very happy and, to be honest, very surprised about these clear words, about these clear messages, uh, which was not so well um, um, recepted by the, by the coalition parties. That means the Social Democrats and the Greens and the, the Liberals. Why I mention that, usually foreign policy is nothing about uh, only uh, about party politics, but uh, in, in this case, I think um, these, or at least two of these three parties, uh, the socialists, socialists and, and the Greens, they have a very, very long way to go from, from uh, the, the, their sources of their parties are the, is the peace movement, maybe the environment movement, but also the peace movement. And for them, this change is much, much bigger or much more severe than, than maybe for, for the other parties. And I think it's it's very important uh, in, in this um, in this uh, question how Germany or why Germany has this reputation that it's reluctant that maybe it's too late too little we know this with with Nord Stream two with uh, with Swift uh, agreement finally we delivered finally we were on board and uh, this is also the same with the, with the heavy weapons we have uh, and we had some problems and we have to convince the people but. In democratic states, I think it's very, very important to take all parties, but also the, the whole society with us. And uh, therefore, I think they have to do a very difficult job, much more than we have. So when I say they, um, it's, it's uh, to convince the people out of these, what I mentioned, the peace movements and so on. And if you now count, uh, count what, what we did in, in humanitarian aid, in financial aid, in military aid, I think um, it's it's uh, it's quite quite a lot, and it definitely helped and, and supported uh, the Ukraine and Ukrainian. Also, when you come to military aid, uh, also the the Ukrainian army to to stand this um, this fight against Russia. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Winkler. Uh, as I said, I'm going to give you a chance to talk a little more before you have to run off to your flight. What do you think Germany should do in the coming months and years? Uh, regarding security and uh, foreign policy, and also how, I mean, considering, I, I mentioned Mr. Publix, he's not alone. I think we see expressions like that from many people in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, should Germany do something to change these attitudes? If so, what could it do? I think the, the, the trust and the confidence uh, got a little damage. Uh, this is no, no way to, to, to talk around that. But um, if, if, you, if you count what we really did, not what we, that we, we have difficult discussions and that it, it took longer maybe, 
but if you then see what is on the ground, if you see our support also for the for the Baltic states, if you see our enforcement in Lithuania, and if you also see uh, when you come to, come to NATO um, that we we have many obligations and we definitely fulfill it in, in a good manner all around the world. And if you see in, in Mali the situation where the French uh, got out and, and we see Wagner troops from, from Russia uh, going there, this conflict is not only concentrated on Ukraine. Of course, it's it's our main, uh, main issue, but um, the rest of the world uh, didn't stop their wars and, and we are very much engaged also there. So with our worldwide contribution to NATO, and um, I think this also should be taken into account when you measure uh, our contribution. And so, um, so the the final message or the short message is, or in a nutshell, um, I think we do better than our reputation, but we could improve. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Mr. Brinkman. I'll, I'll uh, turn to Mr. Klein and Brockhoff. Do you agree? That German has done better than its reputation. Yeah, probably so, but it isn't uh, doing good enough. Let's put yeah. it. Let's start from the opposite. Okay. I, I think what we're seeing here is uh, the first mega crash of German foreign policy has been has been uh, has been displaying in front of our eyes. We are telling ourselves the history of German foreign and security policy since World War II as a history of success of successes from Western integration, NATO membership, uh, to detente, to 1989, to Europe whole and free, to a, to a globalized, integrated, interdependent uh, e economy and, 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 and global system. Now, the, 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 the tenets, the, 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 the basic assumptions of that are challenged about interdependence, about the, how the international system works, about friends or foe. And I think the country is working through that crash. It happened in front of our eyes. It happened in the most brutal way you can think of. And it, hasn't, it has no precedent since 1945. So and what Mr. Schultz did on the 27th, it was a U-turn. It was a U-turn before the country was crashing into a wall. It was a, a, an emergency rescue operation, I would, a, a foreign policy, I would call it. So the expectation that you do this U-turn and then you take, you, you go straight in a different line at 180 speed is, is ill-conceived. There is many things to be worked through in, in, a, in a democratic society in order to do, do that. So where are we there? I, I think on the military side, we're pretty good in, in terms of the 100 billion. There's questions as to the, the debate now is not whether you follow through on this, but whether 100 billion is actually enough and whether eno enough of the existing money can be dispersed at the speed required. That is the right conversation to have, not the wrong conversation to have. The second is, and by the way, why could it be done? For my lifetime, the debate about nuclear sharing that was alive and kicking, even in the, uh, in the coalition uh, debate, uh, just a few months before the 24th of February, I think that debate is dead as long as I live, because whoever tries to, to fiddle with nuclear sharing will be washed away by the, by, by the German electorate. I think every, every person in the country has heard loud and clear what Mr. Putin has said, mm -hmm. and that has consequences for, for the electorate. I'm 100% sure on that, on that account. So I think the, the, we're, we're on the technical side. Have we done enough to reform the military, the procurement system, especially, uh, we will get into a lot of trouble actually doing what we said we, have, we, we want to do uh, and do it in time. But those are the right questions, and, and I think that, that line is pretty clear. And it is pretty clear because, well, all we are doing right now is fulfill NATO planning goals, which had been there for a long time but hadn't been acted upon seriously. 
that's happening. Second, uh, uh, energy security. The U-turn couldn't be starker here. Uh, we're paying a heavy price for it. Uh, the, uh, the compensation package of 200 billion, hard to imagine, is, is, is staggering. Uh, in the end, if this works, we can be thankful for, for, for this, uh, for this uh, well, for this move the, for the, that Mr. Putin then initiated, because it'll, it'll, uh, it'll speed up the energy transformation that, uh, that, that is necessary. So that's already been on path. My problems are with the third piece of, of, of Zeitenwende, which is the Russia piece. Uh, these two initial pieces, they were on track. They were sped up by the 24th. Nobody wanted to decouple from Russia, but well, Germany is now decoupling from Russia, and nobody unto this day has a conception of what a, f a, a, a future relationship with Russia might look like. Um, that's also understandable because the war isn't over. We don't know the shape of Russia. We don't know the leadership of Russia. I, I see why that is not, uh, uh, why we don't have that. But there is also conceptually the idea that we will live in, not in a security environment with Russia, but against Russia for the time uh, for, for, for the time that we can foresee. I think that is, I think Germans have to work through that. And that, that hasn't arrived yet as, mm -hmm. as a consequences for years and maybe decades to come. And there is no conceptual piece of that. And the final piece is the China piece. That's not part of the Zeitenwende, but it is by delineation. Uh, we're not anywhere on that either. So in the end, you say this is about the reinvention of an economic and a, a reinvention of an economic model, China, Russia, uh, energy, and the, and, and the redefinition of a security model. It couldn't be bigger, so I would say, folks, bear with us. This is this is a big one. Don't expect that is it's over in eight months. U-turn has happened, and there they go, full stream in a different direction. That ain't happening. Okay, <laughs> clearly a huge change. You know, you, it's a big ship, right? It's the biggest country in Europe, largest population, largest economy. Hard to turn it around that fast. But one thing that you didn't mention that I also wanted to raise because Mr. Winkler, uh, his, I got an email from him about uh, the Ringtausch, eh, about this, the exchange of weapons and so forth. One thing you didn't mention is aid to Ukraine in, in purely military terms. And maybe, maybe Mr. Winkler, since you raised this issue, I'm going to give you a word. I'm looking at the clock and I see you'll be, be running off in a second. Maybe you could comment specifically about that. Uh, this is, I think, this, the, one of the reasons why people so I assume in the audience as well have been uh, ready to criticize Jeremy. Do you think that this is working well enough? The aid to, and then I'll ask Mr. Klein and Brockhoff to, to say something about that as well. Yes, uh, as I said, uh, there's always room for improvement and also the ring couch uh, in, in the beginning was not a success. Now it, it's going better. And we see with the uh, uh, Czech Republic, uh, Slovenia, with, uh, with Greece, and uh, it, it definitely did, didn't work with Poland, and this is uh, this is a pity. And um, but there might also be some mis or might have been some misunderstanding. I don't know. It, I, I was not in in that, and we we were not um, we were not we were not the inventor of this. Uh, we as a as a, uh, so a Christian Democrat or a Social Union. We're not the inventor of these uh, ring tausch, but um, to be honest, it's it's not the worst thing. Uh, we we could um, support Ukraine um, with, with weapons they know they are trained on, but um, what what we criticize on that is that we um, it, it it's not clear that it's just a question of time when this ring tausch comes to an end because then there is no. Uh, there are no um, Russian tanks or, or, or Soviet um, technic uh, or Soviet invented <laughs> tanks uh, in Eastern or uh, Central Europe anymore, and and therefore the the, the question how we um, can can support Ukrainian army because this this does not stop. But the, we all hope that this war will come to an end uh, sooner than later. But um, even when this war comes to an end. The support, the military aid, does not come to an end because we have to to, to support Ukraine to 
to to stand this um, uh, to stand this uh, threat a against Russia also in the future, and and therefore um, to um, so we are in favor to to support also with with uh, Western military uh, technique and and in, in some parts we did uh, so we don't understand why why we delivered the Gepard and we didn't deliver the Marder and now we deliver the Dingo so it, this is for specialists but. Um, so, so there is, I think this, it's an internal discussion in, in, in Germany. We, we uh, gained some time with the ring tower, but uh, I, I now heard that also UK has thought about um, sending, uh, sending uh, modern tanks to, to Ukraine. And I think this, this question also, also from Madrid, we heard it, but it was then taken back again. But I think this is a question that will come up latest in, in maybe January or February. When, when we cannot uh, stand against uh, one, if I may come back to to one um, uh, one thesis of uh, Mr. Brockhoff, uh, when he said it's it's a U-turn in all these uh, huge um, uh, huge areas like uh, military energy and and so in I think it's not a U-turn in all this. It's it's definitely in in security policy and and military aid because we have. Uh, experienced 75 more than 75 years of peace in, in, in Europe and more than 30 years for Germany there was no enemy around us anymore and this is something you have to take in, to take into account this is so different to the Baltic states where you you have this Russian Russian threat in, in front of your doors uh, we, we don't have that we have, we have Poland Czech Republic we have Switzerland and uh, Switzerland not EU but we, we don't fear them too much so um, therefore, it was, I think, in that time, the right decision to um, to uh, concentrate our military uh, capabilities uh, on on this. What I said, NATO um, support in in other countries and so on. And, and so we did. And now we see that uh, we have to to fight uh, a battle on on the ground on soil with tanks. So uh, we had around 2,000 tanks, I think, 30 years ago. Now we have maybe 200. So it, it, and it was not necessary and, and nobody expected, to be honest, uh, that we would, would ever need them anymore. Um, therefore, this was a total change in, in um, energy supply and, and uh, the other things you mentioned. It was not a U-turn, but it's, it became a huge acceleration. So um, as you said, as you see, we, we already decided to, to, to cut off um, nuclear power. We already decided to, to cut off uh, coal energy but in a in a longer run and it, now we are forced to do it and when when now this situation we all relied on gas to, to, to be a transition um, uh, tr transition technology and now this broke away and this is comes uh, to so the timing is, is really bad for 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 cutting off the gas now because this was our way to get off to to more renewable uh, energies Okay. So it was not a U-turn on this. This was my my. Uh -huh. I think uh, message. I, just, I want to give Mr. Bradberg a chance to say something, and we'll come back to weapons for Ukraine. But Mr. Bradberg, how does this look from Washington? Uh, I mean, so, does... so, sorry, Mr. Mr. Yeah. Rossi. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Me, if I enter, now I have to. I have the boarding. So oh, yeah. uh, if I miss the second flight, I, I think. <laughs> okay. See you in I would Riga. Never come okay. to Riga. <laughs> See you in Riga and have a safe flight. Yes, yeah, very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, for Botschafter uh, Christian Held, uh, you will continue, I, I think, even better than I did. Thank Very you much. Good. See you uh, tonight in, in Riga. Very good. Or this afternoon. Okay, Bye. so this is like uh, being in an airport doing FaceTime with people. All the <laughs> discussion is uh, wonders of modern technology. Okay, Mr. Bradberg, how does this all look from Washington? Sure, thanks. Well, it's great to be here, great to be here in person, um, and it's great to be in Latvia. I just want to acknowledge. Um, Latvia's leadership by example, I think, on the Ukraine war. We heard from the president yesterday, a uh, third of your defense budget, 1% of GDP to Ukraine. That's really impressive. You're leading by example. Uh, second of all, I want to apologize for being part of this mantle. It is embarrassing in 2022 that we have five white men on a stage. So I really want to bring in some other perspectives, uh, more diverse perspectives from the audience. Um, but thanks for the question. Um, and. Let me just say, before I come to how this is viewed from Washington, and we can discuss that, and Thomas will have views on that as well, um, I do want to kind of reiterate um, a couple of the points that I've heard. I do think 
The second Vendee is real. I do think the direction where Germany is heading is very clear. We can argue that it's not fast enough, that Germany should do more, that's fine. But to me, it's pretty clear uh, that it's heading in the right direction. I mean, you know, 1.2 billion in military aid to Ukraine, uh, increasingly providing these more advanced military systems to Ukraine that actually are being used very successfully by Ukraine in the counteroffensive. So they're actually making a difference on the ground. That's meaningful. Largest single EU donor to Ukraine in terms of financial assistance, um, over uh, 4 billion euros, that's very significant. Decoupling from Russian energy, something that would have been completely unthinkable, you know, a year ago. Um, continuing to lead in the G7, which has been so important, especially on sanctions um, on, on Russia, but also on food security um, and on, on this idea of the oil price cap, for instance. I think that these are significant examples. Um, and I think also, of course, you know, uh, supporting Ukraine's EU aspirations um, and its future membership potential. And um, this new uh, work that Germany is doing together with Poland on kind of leading, spearheading this military training for Ukraine. These, these are significant, I think, examples of Germany stepping up. Where I see um, what's lacking is maybe not so much the stuff, the doing stuff. Sure, they could do more. But what to me is lacking is sometimes the messaging, that it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of blurred, it's confusing, um, and, and not always clear uh, what Germany's uh, strategy is. I think we sometimes hear, you know, maybe a reluctance from especially the chancellor to talk about the need for Ukraine to win for victory, which, which I think is important to reiterate, um, instead of just saying we want Russia to lose. We actually want Ukraine to, to be victorious and we want strategic defeat of Russia. Um, and there's sometimes kind of blurred messaging between different parts of the government. So that, I think, is a legitimate concern. Sometimes there's also maybe a sense that Germany, it's, it's convenient for Germany to uh, not be out in front and lead, but to kind of hide somewhere in the middle and hide behind the U.S. Um, and sometimes maybe blaming kind of the, 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 their own inaction on the lack of action from the U.S., for instance, with the, with the uh, leopard tanks, for instance. Mm -hmm. Biden is not doing it, therefore we should not do it. Mm -hmm. I think that's the wrong approach. I think if you want to do it, you can go out in front and lead and, and do it. Um, I think there's also maybe a sense that sometimes letting the fear of escalation, which is something, by the way, that is very much shared, I think, by, by the White House, um, be an excuse for sort of inaction. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we have seen, I think, you know, the U.S., despite having similar fears, actually stepping up and, and doing stuff. So that's not a legitimate uh, excuse either. Um, and then I think what, what um, Mr. Winkler said, which I think is very true, is sometimes um, maybe not having the sense that our own security is really at stake, which, which it is. And I think that should motivate us uh, to do even more. Um, so, um, you know, it, in summary, I would just say, I, th I think Germany is heading in the right direction. Rather than bashing it, um, we should uh, criticize it where it deserves to be criticized, but encourage it to do more. And I think what's ultimately is really essential uh, is that we have a Germany that's stepping up and it's leading in Europe and leading in the transatlantic alliance. And I think there's definitely potential for Germany to do more. Mm -hmm. I wanted to pick up this issue of Germany leading and turn also to the, what should happen in the future, because Germany is undoubtedly the leading nation in the European Union. I and mean, there's no question about that. And yet, if it doesn't articulate and then implement a vision of where we should be going in terms of security policy, then it's not fulfilling one of the functions of a leader. And I was wondering if Mr. Klanenbrokhoff, if you could comment on that about German policy going forward. Can it take up this mantle? Can it really do that, that, that to herd everybody, well, to gather everybody together and get us all pointed in the same direction? Or will it continue to sort of lead from behind or, you know, try, or do a lot but try to avoid advertising it, which leads to all sorts of complications and, as we can see, yeah, lots of tensions. <clears throat> Some of the members of the, of the cabinet ha have said that they would like to see Germany take up that role. Mm -hmm. it, it, it sounds far away for me. Yeah. It sounds not like tomorrow. Mm -hmm. If you want to lead, you need some followers. Mm -hmm. uh, where would you find them these days? Um, so it seems to me th this, is a, this is an ambition th that you actually have to work towards. Mm -hmm. um, and Zeitenwende is a vehicle to do that, mm -hmm. but where the country isn't there. I would li also like to 
point out that the, the, that the economic piece of this is not, a secondary, is not a secondary element. When we look at Europe since, 2000, uh, since the, the Great Recession, uh, we've, have, we've seen a pretty good economic performance. Why is that? Because of the great stabilizer in the middle. Um, that is now in question. We're talking about, this is not just about energy prices, this is about the question, people are now talking about the, the, the threat of deindustrialization. Mm -hmm. Will we survive this energy shock in one piece as an industrial country? Mm -hmm. Remember, Germany has an industrial uh, potential that far outweighs many other countries in Europe and, uh, and, and as part of GDP also Britain and the United States. So the question of its stability and its future economic model is the baseline for, for the attempt to even fulfill a leadership role. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you're going to see a, a country in trying to reinvent itself. If you think of the German, the, the, the quip has always been, you know, has been relying in, in its security policy on the United States, in cheap energy on Russia, and a big market from China. That's the German model. Well, all three legs of that three-legged stools have been, are challenged. We're trying to fix the first two at a high price and haven't even gotten to the third one. Um, so, you know, talking about leadership in military terms in that environment, I think is a far, you know, I would see the country is a far-fetched assumption that some would like to see in the country, but uh, we're going to have a lot of things to work through these things. And how, how difficult it is to reinvent yourself with a new economic model. Well, you can look at Britain, how the, how the Brits are doing with that these days. The Chinese are, are, are need to do that. The Italians haven't, haven't succeeded in doing the, that the last 30 years. So we better hope that uh, uh, Germany will be able to actually deal with this shock. Mm -hmm. Is it about that, Ken? I think that's absolutely true. But leaving that aside, I think there's still more that Germany can do right now, even as it undergoes that transformation uh, that Thomas is talking about. I mean, I, I think, you know, as I said, speaking more clearly would be very helpful. Uh, speaking clearly about the need for Ukraine to be victorious, speaking clearly about the need to not have any premature negotiations, but to rather help Ukraine succeed and then be if they choose to negotiate from a position of strength, recognize that we are in geopolitical competition with Russia, uh, with China, um, and that even if there were to be some eventual resolution to the Ukraine war, uh, there will not be a going back to normal with Russia, at least as long as Putin is in power. So that, you know, speaking clearly would be very welcome. Um, stop using these kind of strawman arguments that we sometimes hear that sort of, you know, because Ukrainian <laughs> asked for uh, a no-fly zone, and we didn't give it to them, therefore we don't have to give them tanks that we heard yeah. from um, Wolfgang Schmidt recently. You know, that, that's not useful. So, so speaking more clearly, um, I think Germany can do much more in terms of um, building that type of um, European pillar within NATO and a stronger European defense policy. Um, and I think Germany can do much more in terms of reaching out to Central Eastern Europe. I've talked to people here who've pointed out that Germany is kind of missing in action in Central Eastern Europe, maybe not here in Latvia, but in other parts of Central Europe. So I think um, a, a stronger German um, effort to reach out, to kind of reassure, rebuild trust in that part of Europe would be very welcomed and I think would, would, um, should be embraced. Um, forging a, a vision that sort of a vision for Europe that's stronger, but that's still anchored in the transatlantic alliance that I think is a bit different from what we sometimes hear from Paris about strategic autonomy. I think that uh, could, could go a long way. Um, and then, you know, as, as Tomas knows more than anyone, uh, leading on the reconstruction effort in Ukraine and the financial assistance that Ukraine will need to just sustain itself over, over the coming months as we're looking at a, a very tough winter. These are all areas where Germany can lead right now as it undergoes that transformation to be able to become a stronger leader in Europe going forward. Maybe we should, uh, we should suggest the German government hire Eric because that was a pretty good agenda. <laughs> 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 Very good. I see uh, there are questions coming in on Slido already, and uh, I think, I assume there will be a lot of questions from the audience, and I would like also to, but I'm only seeing men, come on, come on, come on. Let's, <laughs> we want, we want to, I want a question from a woman now, please. 
<laughs> because as Mr. Prakash very, very pertinently said, we are not just the one that don't want it. Well, really? No questions? Okay, very good. Then, Tom, I'll, I'll ask you that first question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm sorry I have a comment and question. You know, I feel the puzzled. Um, honorable panelists, whatever you say suggests to me that we are getting even more in puzzle. German foreign security policy, mega crash, and it's like a simple statement. It doesn't sound so. I mean, it's not a collective guilt. There were people behind who were doing conscientiously or unconscientiously, one or another thing, which actually moved Germany towards this mega crash. Well, there is a report by independent um, uh, investigative journalism fund called Corrective Org, I think, about uh, Gazprom lobby. There, is, there are political articles about people who were promoting uh, conscientiously or unconscientiously this policy. So, for example, in my life, I, I work for a university in the healthcare and we visit often municipalities and the hospitals in Germany. And sometimes they say, well, where you were? We've been told by local elites that you have to go to Russia. Now we are told that you have to go to Baltic region and thank you, you are coming. So we, we have a cooperation probably ahead of us. So uh, the, my question is, don't you need to think about your political elites, which are full of Russland's Versteher, who still argue or sit silent, but I mean, you need to get rid of those because you need the strengths in your policy, and the strength of policy is in clarity and simplicity. And that's what probably Europeans want to get from you, because we expect you to become a leaders and we are ready to go after you. But there needs to be internal steps to be done in order to get straighter, clearer, more understandable German policies. Thank you. Uh, if you could just identify yourself as well. Thomas, if you could just identify yourself, the panel doesn't know here. Yeah. I will ask No, 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 no. So if you identify yourself, if you could say who you My are. name is Thomas Wallman, so I'm a well, former chairman of LATO. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The question to, I don't who would like to address it. <laughs> Good question, Thomas. <laughs> the, uh, the, I'm myself wondering how this, uh, how this process of looking into the, into the mirror is going to, in, in looking back and how we got to where we were, where we're getting, how that is happening, or how that can be happening. The governing, the, the governing folks, the folks in government right now will say, we have to, we have to uh, take care of the future. We're quite busy with the future. We can't deal with the past. That's uh, sort of understandable from a government position, but from a societal position, that's unacceptable. Um, I'm actually quite disappointed with some of the, uh, the things that I'm, that I'm hearing. I'm most disappointed with the former chancellor. Uh, uh, Angela Merkel, who seems to have done nothing wrong, and I think that sets a terrible example. That sets a terrible example. Now, I'm not suggesting she's in the pocket of, of anybody. That's other people. That's not her. But what I would expect from her is to reassess that policy in the light of today's, uh, in, in the light of today's uh, uh, developments. And she is simply refusing to do that. And, 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 and it's not helpful because it emboldens those in our uh, body politic who are status quo type people, who are actually saying uh, uh, nothing ever went wrong. And she's doing that, she, and there's one key sentence that she has said. Well, diplomacy, even if it failed, wasn't wrong. Well, that's true, but that is not the claim. The claim is diplomacy unarmed with a dictator doesn't work. That's where I would like her to go, and that's where I would like her to reassess her own role and her own mistakes, and her own mistakes were to talk about 2% but not pursue 2%. 
She actually went to the, uh, to the NATO summit in Brussels in 2018 and said, we're committed to 2%, which is why we're doing 1.5%. Right? That, that is, uh, in short, of what she said in 2018. And she is today, there's no reckoning with that. I'm actually finding there's no reckoning in, uh, I'm sorry to say Mr. Winkler is now on a plane, Mr. Winkler's party, the, uh, the, the, the Bavarians. There is, no, there is no such thing. I'm seeing actually the, the most of that within the Social Democrats. When you look at uh, the chairman of the Social Democrats, Lars Klingbeil, only this past week, he actually gave a speech in which he named the four points in which fundamentally his party went wrong. I think that's what I would like to see and that's what I'm seeing too little of. Okay. If I, sorry, yeah, yeah, just yeah, yeah. jump in on that one. I think these are very important points because um, I don't believe in conspiracy theories like uh, Moscow has the uh, German government and the political class in its pocket. I mean, um, we know about um, um, a former politician in high-ranking positions, but uh, that is not valid for the political scene in Berlin. So call us naive, call us late, call us what you want. By the way, please give up your prejudices about German perfection. That is also an important point to make because some also in this region still tend to believe that we are perfect, we are perfectly organized, the Bundeswehr is perfectly equipped, etc., etc. That is not the case. We're working on it. But to come back to the, um, this particular point, um, which is also a big, big problem in messaging and also communication, what has been mentioned earlier on, we do have to work on that. I absolutely agree that there is room for improvement, not just now, but also since uh, the beginning of the year, because indeed Zeitenwende has to be um, filled up with further narratives. What do we want to do with it? Where do we want to go? And then also implement it. What I'm seeing is also a, light, a slight uh, disconnect between reality and the things we're actually doing. I do remember that uh, back in July, uh, a well-known British paper titled that Germany was backtracking on the Madrid decisions. What was this about? This was about the agreement between Chancellor Scholz and the Lithuanian President Nauseda about the implementation of the brigade force in Lithuania. Well, a few weeks ago, um, the Bundeswehr established the first uh, permanent brigade structures in Lithuania. The Bundeswehr and other NATO partners together with Lithuanian troops are already doing brigade style exercises in Lithuania. So actually, on the ground, we're doing the stuff. Um, I haven't seen a correction on the backtracking in that particular British paper. But, you know, that's the thing. And I, I have to admit, um, um, it's also part of our, um, let's say, room for improvement in communication that we're in this situation that every time something comes out of Berlin, it's immediately, oh, what are the Germans up to now? Mm. So, <laughs> complex. Yes. <laughs> uh, we have a little over 15 minutes left, so I'll give out, uh, very good. Th three questions there, and yeah, three I'll take three questions, and then uh, we'll have an answer. So first one, second one, and third one over there. Thank you. My name is Amelie Teusen. I'm a senior researcher at the Danish Institute for International Studies. Um, I have a question regarding sort of the German public and the support of the German public for these policies and sort of the, what's necessary in the future for Germany, um, as you're suggesting. Now that the energy prices are rising, the fear is there for a cold winter. And we heard yesterday from Claudia Mayo about the unity that we will have to fight for over the course of the winter. What's your take on that? Thank you. Thank you. Second question there, if we bring in, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, good morning, uh, Ginzia German is former diplomat of Latvia and uh, um, associate researcher at the Latvian Institute of International Affairs. Um, my question would be about the Zeitenwende 2.0. Um, uh, next decade is going to be dominated by the US and China rivalry. And uh, now we see that the German Chancellor is going to China. Uh, what's your take on that? Thank you. Thank you. And third question here. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Lieutenant Robert Rasm for from National Armed Forces. And small remark, I really wanted to, Mr. Winkler to uh, hear it, but it's also relevant, uh, relevant here. Uh, there was no such thing as uh, peace in Europe for 75 years. It's a bad excuse, I'm sorry, gentlemen. Uh, Hungary, uh, Czech Republic, uh, even German, in Germany, Soviet troops shot up uh, in 1956, the demonstrations. And 2014 in Ukraine, so let's not, let's not. 2008, stop. Georgia. Of, yes, of course. It's technically not uh, Europe, maybe. Um, but uh, Mr. Wingler said there was need for a time uh, to uh, convince the Germans to send help. In the same time, it is quite easy to help Ukraine when it's going after her son now. When the uh, Russian WDV troops were in Hostomel, uh, Germany blocked uh, Estonia from sending hobbitsers to the uh, Ukraine. And uh, my question is to His Excellency, and maybe you can have some small uh, remarks also. And now there is German brigade in Lithuania. There's German armed elements in uh, Adash. In the next crisis, will be there a need to convince German people be be before uh, the action is needed. Thank you. Three, I'll, I have answer and then I will get there. So three very different questions. Maybe we can, Ambassador, you could start with this one and then we can move around and see, yeah. Basically, that also uh, goes back on the first question about popular support. I'd just like to take you back to 1999. Um, there was a foreign minister called Joschka Fischer and he stood for joining the coalition of the willing, the NATO efforts um, in the Kosovo conflict. And I still vividly remember how he got a red color back at the party convention of the Greens against his head because he stood for that. Why am I saying this? This will be crucial for the next weeks, months and years. The political leadership, not just in our country, all over partner governments, the communication to keep this popular support up. The interesting thing is that according to polls in Germany, support for the Ukraine support is actually rising. We're at something like 74% last week, um, ZDF poll, um, supporting this. But I also agree with what was said yesterday at that particular panel mentioned. We are going to have a tough winter to go through, not just in Germany. But Germany will be crucial for many other things. We've been talking about financing. Yesterday we heard also about the um, completely new way that European instruments are also used to militarily support Ukraine. Well, every fourth euro out of the European budgets come from Germany. So I think it's really vital that we get our act together, that we get through this winter in a um, good way, because other challenges will be waiting for that. We need this popular support. And concretely on your question, this here, Lithuania, Latvia, is Article 5 territory. And when Minister Baerbock was visiting um, Riga in what? April, she also said that very clearly, every inch of NATO territory. So here, I think we're in a completely different ballgame concerning NATO obligations, where I think 
there are lots of things where I agree Germany has room for improvement, but with respect to NATO obligations, be it on land, be it in the Baltic Sea, be it with the air policing, for example, where we are once again framework with nation right now um, for the Baltic uh, states, I think there we are on target, we're doing our stuff and even more than that. Okay. Uh, moving on, China, and we also have a question from Slido uh, regarding China with the failure of the Wandel durch Handel regarding Russia. What implications does that have for Germany's engagement with the wider world, including with China? And maybe the I Washington perspective would be valuable here, considering that the U.S.-China relation will be, or competition will be defining for the next years. Happy to take a stab at the China question. I mean, you know, in the U.S., they just released the national security strategy um, just two weeks ago, and it makes it very clear that while Russia is an immediate security threat in Europe. China is the long-term strategic adversary that will shape uh, the global geopolitical system. Uh, and this will have massive implications for Europe, including Germany. Um, I think the, the, the German approach towards China, this traditional approach of viewing it mainly through a trade prism, uh, this is changing. This is clearly changing. Um, this is, predates the Seitenwende. Um, and we've seen Germany certainly being willing at a European level to support stronger European trade defense, screening of investments, um, thinking more about diversification and so on and so forth. That is very positive. Uh, launching its own in the Pacific strategy, thinking more about uh, its own relationships um, in, in the Indo-Pacific, uh, working with the US uh, on, on, on discussing China strategically. That's all fine. Um, but I think there's much more work to be done here. Um, and I think there's much more of a need to rec recognize the lessons um, from the Ukraine war in terms of our over-dependence on Russia for energy, in terms of our dependence on China for a host of different um, uh, products um, and, and supply chains that we rely on. And here, I think it's a bit worrisome that, uh, again, it's kind of the, the, the blurring of messages. We hear very strong rhetoric on China coming from the Foreign Office, Minister Baerbach, uh, but at the same time, we see Chancellor Schultz going to China, um, talking about deepening uh, or at least maintaining trade ties with China, uh, supposedly being willing to approve this Chinese takeover by a Chinese state-owned company of the Port of Hamburg. You know, this is worrisome, right? Um, and it sends the wrong message. I think what we need in Europe um, is a recognition of the China challenge, thinking about scenarios about Taiwan, the type of scenarios that, you know, we're, we're now seeing playing out in Ukraine, what would happen in the event of that in, 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 in a real crisis in Taiwan, and thinking about this also from the point of view of how to keep the U.S. engaged and committed in Europe. Uh, because I think the U.S. will look at Europe to, to continue to uh, take more responsibility in Europe as the U.S. in the long term shifts more focus to the Indo-Pacific. That is inevitable. U the Ukraine war has, has, has shown that the U.S. remains committed in Europe, will continue to be present uh, in Europe uh, for the foreseeable future. But in the long run, there's no doubt that it will have to shift resources to, towards the Indo-Pacific that will require uh, Germany and Europe to take more responsibility at home. Mm -hmm. So the China issue, I think, is really key, um, and the Ukraine war should, should give us a lot of reflection about how we deal with it. Mm -hmm. Do you have something to add? Yes. Um, the question is whether in the, in the, uh, the, the, the China challenge in my country will be seen as a systemic competition mm -hmm. or as a great power competition. Mm -hmm. If it's a systemic competition, then uh, there, is, there is a strategic shift to be done in Germany. Mm -hmm. If it's a great power competition, then the, the tendency will be to hedge, to hedge stay, out of the, stay out of the game, avoid being drawn into it. Mm -hmm. That Mr. Schultz is going to, uh, to China, I can't criticize. Uh, he, there's a lot of things to be talked about with Mr. Xi, starting with Russia. Um, uh, he, uh, there's two years of hiatus of, of, of direct conversation. We should encourage our leaders to actually talk with each other in a situation like that. What I do criticize is that he does a, a, a trip that will have the, uh, the appearance of business as usual because he's taking a, a, a business delegation. And I'd be hard pressed to see uh, 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 to understand why that uh, is any different than his predecessor's uh, uh, pro approach to China, although he claims it. Uh, and then, uh, you mentioned it, Eric, 
uh, I think the uh, taking a 35% stake is not quite overtaking, but it's a, it's a large minority stake in the, uh, in, in the port of Hamburg, sends that very same signal, and it sends the signal that we're being led by the mayor of Germany. Um, and, and that is where we're going. Now, there's one element that I do understand of why they're struggling. Uh, we're decoupling from Russia at, at this very moment. German industry has retreated from Russia and the energy uh, uh, relationship is at zero. Do you want to take do, to go down that same road at the same time uh, with China? So there's got to be a bit, a, a bit of pacing in that. But I can't, what I don't, I fail to see uh, is, uh, is a a strategic communication of what these steps ought to be. Now, that said, the China strategy that yep. the German government is planning out is not there yet. I, we, I would hope I will see it. I will see the sequence of that and the end point of that. What type of diversification are we actually aiming at? And what would, in, what would concrete steps other than declarations to get to diversification actually mean? Mm -hmm. that, that is what I would need to see. And that is what I don't see out of this government quite yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have five minutes left. Uh, I hope the organizers will forgive us for going a little over time because it's such an interesting discussion, but I'll take one more round of questions. So there. Uh, thank you very much for the microphone. My name is Simon Draper. I'm from New Zealand. I'm pretty confident I've come the furthest away. <laughs> if I was jumping on a plane, it would take me 36 hours uh, to get here as opposed to your colleague. Uh, as you know, New Zealand's not part of NATO, uh, but yet again, we are supplying um, some training and some financing in the war in Ukraine. And I just want to make one point. I'm not quite sure the people of Tingre or South Sudan would say this is the biggest breach of international law since 1945. The question I've got is a country like New Zealand has spilt a lot of its blood and treasure in this part of the world over the last hundred years. Yet when we listen to the German narrative, your equities in this seem to be much, much greater than ours. We worry about the South China Sea, the DPRK, Taiwan, uh, the organisation I'm with, Asia New Zealand, we have about uh, 10 dialogues across Asia. You know, if you're talking decoupling with China, it's not going to be decoupling. So my question is, what is the German narrative to a country like New Zealand about why we should spend more blood and treasure on this continent in the Ukraine. Thank you. Great. Okay. Question there. Sir, you had a yes. Yeah. The microphone's up there. Uh, I think uh, we talk very much about norms, standards, values, and uh, thank of our Ukraine. If you could identify yourself, yeah. please. So uh, I'm for. Tuan Nguyen from Boston Global Forum. I'm CEO of Boston Global Forum together with Governor Michael Dukakis. Mm -hmm. He is chairman. And uh, we think we would like to ask, so how we can manage business relations with China to maintain standards, norms, values. We respect, I think, nearly dif uh, very difficult with business and they impact us in policy, and not only in Europe, but also in the US. So this is a big problem how we solve that. Very good. Quick question. I, I'm, uh, right. yeah. Hi, I'm Captain Wolf. I work for the commander of the multinational corps in Northeast. Um, so having been seeing my friends going to Afghanistan, being wounded and killed, and then uh, seeing the debacle of last year, or myself going to Mali, and seeing the security situation deteriorate, and now we have the situation with Russia, where I think German uh, foreign policy has failed over the last 30 years. I wonder what can we do better to not repeat those mistakes going forward, and what are the things that we need to implement to not have those things happen? Do we need a National Security Council or things like that? Thank you. Okay. And finally, one last, last question, and then we'll finish this. Uh, thank you, Andrew Mick, the Marshall Center. A very practical question and a very brief one. Uh, fully appreciate that, you know, declarations of every inch of NATO territory that will be defended. I completely agree with that. My question is with what? I think the, the question of stocks being depleted in Europe, uh, ammunition, lead time productions, a dry metal, all of that brings a very simple question. Why aren't European governments, not just the German government, 
uh, asking industry to ramp up to wartime production for stocks, looking at consumption of munitions in Ukraine, pretty soon it will not be a question of political will, but just the, the substantial real technical aid that won't be available. Why aren't you doing more in that score? Very, uh, we often hear the term tour de raison, we go from New Zealand <laughs> to Rheinmetall, right? it's very wide, but can, so. Can, can I just take yeah. on one, and, 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 and that is, uh, the, the, Captain Wolf, these are the types of blanket statements about German foreign policy that I start resenting, which is German foreign policy has failed vis-a-vis -vis Russia for the last 30 years, if I quote you correctly. Might I remind you that there was an age, that, that there was something called 1990, and that we all in the Western countries uh, uh, thought interdependence was going to be our joint future and there was a transformation hope that included russia by the way included china we can all debate how realistic that was how hubristic our own approach to that is but i think singling out germany and saying its old policy has failed it sets the wrong tone to this debate i think we should be careful about singling out Germany in that, and that's, that's my thing to say. Okay, very good. What, why should New Zealand and countries in the Pacific care about the war in Ukraine? Well, the war in Ukraine is not just about Ukraine. It's not even just about European security. It's about international order, and New Zealand has a stake uh, in that. Um, it's about territorial integrity um, of a country. It's about the ability of a great power to invade a smaller neighbor with, with impunity. Um, and so I think this is really important to set a message at a global level that this is unacceptable. And that's why our policy should be to, to have a strategic Russian defeat in Ukraine. And I think uh, the, the efforts by your government in supporting the G7 sanctions um, and so on and so forth are very helpful in that regard. And I do think, I do think it matters. And I do think also, um, as I alluded to earlier, I think it also sends a message to China as it looks at what it wants to do in the next decade in Taiwan, in the South Pacific, um, a major defeat of Russia in Ukraine um, and, and, and proving that the democratic world sticks together and is, and is you know, uh, strong and capable sends a very clear message. Finally, continuing to engage the global south. I think that's so critical. We had a UN vote the other week, 143 countries condemning Russia's war. Uh, that's, that, that was better than what a lot of Western officials hoped for, but it's not good enough. So we need to continue working there to build this type of global coalitions and your country's role will be, will be really important in that regard as well. So Ambassador, thanks for your support. Ambassador, help perhaps something about engaging with China and maintain, but maintaining our principles? Sorry, no, I'd rather take oh, your question okay, because good. I think that is one of the key challenges uh, for not just the next weeks and months, but years. And also very much depends on the narratives um, governments in Europe will have to pick up. You're speaking to somebody who served in the Alpine Division in the 80s. You're sitting in our, with the Marshall Center, I understood correctly, in my former divisional headquarters. Uh, back then, Bundeswehr, half a million. And as Tobias Winkler said earlier on, we were not talking about 200 leopards if they run or don't not run, but 2,000. Uh, so just to get the dimension straight. But then came the 90s. Zeitenwende, we might also cite one other word, Friedensdividende, and that was not just Germany. We all said Europe now is peace and security challenges are far away in places like in Afghanistan, which also fundamentally changed the structure, not just of the Bundeswehr, but also of the Bundeswehr. We flipped in the 90s from territorial defense doing the very difficult job of adapting for missions abroad. I cited Kosovo, but I think the biggest one was Afghanistan. So basically the narrative we were sold for 20 years is security challenges are abroad. We have to adapt to that. And with abroad, let's like really far away. And suddenly we're discovering and call it naivety, whatever, we're back to territorial defense which also means industry. So yes, absolutely. And then also getting our act as Europeans together, not to have 27 government procurement 
um, or th 30 government procurement red tape lines for all of that we're facing right now. So absolutely agree. Great. I saw a big sign on the screen that we have to end. <laughs> <laughs> and so we will end. Thank you for the, I think it's been a fascinating discussion. I'm sure this could go on for quite a while because German policy obviously is crucial for Europe and the world as a whole. Thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you to everyone for coming. And